great thought, isn't it? Carrying the hope of Jesus. You can carry the hope of Jesus. You can walk in the hope that is in Jesus. Awesome. Well, um, it's great to see you all, as I said. We are privileged to have Andy Nimmo going to come and share the word. Terry and I met him um, through Scott Wilson and Neuralead uh, last year, wasn't it? Yes. And we both independently have the same kind of a sense in God. And uh, he preached this morning, and I think he blew a lot of minds in a very positive way, um, helped people, uh, just really did some good things. So I really encourage you to lean in because this is going to be well worth it. I mean, hear what God's got to say to you. So welcome Andy as he comes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say uh, it's an absolute privilege to be here. And um, like Glenn said, and, and we met Glenn and Terry just last year. And yeah, we definitely connected. And coming here today, I just want to say it, it does just feel like home in York, uh, where we have our church and um, the worship, phenomenal, you know, kudos to the team and, and the guys behind the desk. It just sounds brilliant. So um, yeah, it does feel a bit like being at home. Just to clarify, I know my accent's a little bit strange. I'm from York, which is the north of England, um, but I'm actually originally from the south. I lived abroad for a few years in different parts, went to an American school for a year. So my accent is pretty much shot at. But one fact is that my dad is from Glasgow. So I have got some Scottish blood in me. All right. So hopefully you can receive what I'm about to say. I'm not just, you know, the English coming. Um, Braveheart is one of my favorite films. And I side with the Scottish every time. Um, maybe not when it comes to rugby, but we won't go there. <laughs> so, just ruined it right there. Um, I've been married for just over 12 years uh, to Anna, my wife, and we've got four kids, 8641. I promise you that's their age. It's not my PIN number. And uh, it's fantastic. I have to say, if anyone's a parent, you know that it, it, it looks great when they're all smiling. And I have a couple of pictures, which you can have a look if you didn't get a chance to see them as they came in. But uh, these are like the unusual moments in life where you can have children approximately looking at a camera and giving a positive uh, body posture to you know, capture for that moment. I'd probably say like 90% of the time, it's not at all looking like that, as any parent I'm sure will testify as well. It's, it's, it's hard work, and, um, and so I'm always in awe of people like Glenn and Terry who have five children, um, all grown up, and so uh, we, we've got plenty to learn. So Anna and I, we, we've been leading the church in York. Um, we've been involved for, for years, over a decade, and then probably more recently, our senior leaders are just on the, on the process next weekend of moving down to London. We have a church plant there that they're going to be focused on, as well as some other work that they're on with. So it's, it's a little bit of a new role for us to be directly leading it and uh, not just kind of serving the, the senior leader very close at hand. So we've definitely still got some L plates on. So, um, but hopefully you'll get something from this morning. I just want to say we, we run a couple of businesses. Uh, one of them is a children's nursery. And we, um, sometimes people ask like, oh, does that mean you really love kids and, and you, did you work with them every day? I'm like, no, no, no. We started the nursery so we didn't have to. <laughs> I, I do love kids now, it's grown and having our own has definitely helped in that process. But we, we have three children's nurseries at the moment, um, employ about 120 plus people and we look after about 500 uh, families um, in the area of York. So it's, yeah, it's, it's exciting. It means that life is never dull. There's never a dull moment. Even running a church is probably the most exciting thing that goes on because so much can happen in the lives of people. And we are in a people business. We love it. So I'm passionate about church. One of the reasons I'm passionate about church is because what it's done for my life. Hand on heart, it has completely transformed our life. Jesus, through the vehicle of church, Coming into it, into York in 2005, I remember walking into church and thinking, what is this? I'd grown up in church, but I'd never actually come to a place like we've just done earlier, where people are singing and they're worshiping. They're, they actually believe what's on the screen. Like, it's, 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 it was so surprising walking into church back then, hearing a message that I could understand. I was so used to just kind of switching off, and hopefully you won't do that with me this morning, but hearing a message from at the time as our senior leader just talking about the bible in a way that i could understand and then over time i can't say it was overnight it was definitely over months and years transformation started to happen 
And it was, it was really because of church that we got involved in business. I had no interest in business. My mom and dad, uh, we would, I would say the word that would define us as a family is unassuming. <laughs> I grew up being kind of in the shadows, just kind of very happy in the background of life and what was going on. And so business wasn't something where we'd grown up thinking, oh, yeah, I've got a family background in that. Anna's mom and dad, they were physiotherapists, still are. Our business is not kind of on the mind for them. So when we came to church, we were introduced to, to this idea, to this concept, and amongst lots of other things. And it started to shape how we thought, how we think. The kingdom it really impacted our life. And that's why I love church, because it brings heaven here on earth. It's like we've got a, a, an area where heaven has invaded and we get to every week come into this space where we can learn, realign our thinking back to God and what he says and experience powerful transformation. You can't get it from life coaching or, or just books and other things. No, we have the power of the Holy Spirit that is changing our life on the inside. You see, I believe the church can be and should be the most successful organization in the world in the world why not like we, we we have we can benefit from the wisdom of the world but we have the creator's book of life that we can look to we have the holy spirit who can transform us from the inside out we don't have to just rely on on, on therapy and counseling and drugs and different things to cause change no we can be renewed on the inside by the maker of the heavens and earth it's unbelievable. You know, we talk about the church being the bride of Christ. It's right up there. And yet so often, and I, I'm, I've, I've been foul of this in the past, sometimes church gets treated down here. And yet it's so, so powerful. It's where we can experience Jesus on a weekly basis. We can be encouraged by the brothers and sisters who are believing. And so I'm, I love church. I love what it's done for our life, for our family. I honestly don't believe I could be stood here today. I don't believe I'd have a family, certainly not four kids. I mean, who does that? <laughs> There's not many. Statistics say it's 1.6, probably declining now. So that's definitely a work of the Holy Spirit and a few other things that, you know, practically are involved in <laughs> children coming around. So I've got a message that hopefully ties in to a theme that you'll be very familiar with. And it's taken from that scripture in Zechariah 4, verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I want to talk about being spirit-led. And it's one of our values in our church back in York, in Global. And so uh, it's exciting to be able to share some thoughts on this. The title of my message, if you're interested in titles, is The Greatest Odyssey. I'm not very good at titles, so I gave it my best shot, and I thought this would be something that hopefully piques some curiosity. It piqued my curiosity, because I'm thinking, what does Odyssey mean? So I Googled it, and it says, a long and eventful or adventurous journey or experience. And I think that sums up in many ways the Christian life when we are spirit-led. The way I see it, that humanity has two options, broadly speaking, to be spirit-led or led by the flesh. Now, most of the world is led by the flesh. I started off led by the flesh. I wanted what felt good, what looked good, what sounded good, according to what the world was doing. You know, really, I looked at the patterns of the world and thought, come on, maybe I need to fit in with that crowd so I can find friendship and acceptance. Or maybe I need to earn that money so I can have those belongings and look like the person on the advert on TV. Or perhaps I needed that relationship or that experience to validate that I'm someone of worth or that I've got a place here on this earth, someone that's secure, significant, or satisfied. You know, or we can be led by the Spirit. You see, so much of the world is trying to make sense of life. And I, and I feel for them because it's like, ah, oh, it's so close. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is so close. It's at hand. And yet, people just can't see it. And I believe when we're spirit-led, led by God Almighty, the one who created you, the one who designed you and fashioned you in your mother's womb, we can be led by the Holy Spirit, the one who created everything. So when we look up to, I don't know, a great entrepreneur like Elon Musk or a great comedian like Kevin Hart or whatever thing that you're into, God is behind that greatness. God is the creative genius behind the people that we look up to and we respect. You see, in global, we sometimes talk about moving from safe to scary. 
And not to say that when we follow the patterns of the world, it's necessarily safe. No, it often ends in damage, disaster, pain, turmoil. But actually, when we choose to be led by the Spirit, it's definitely not a safe ride. It's often scary. You know, I can imagine when Peter being called out by Jesus when he's in the boat to walk on water. Oh, yes, yeah, safe, safe. I mean, did you check whether his, you know, swimming proficiency was up to standard? Could he, could he manage the waves and whatever? He was like, called out, I will go. Jesus calls us to rely on him, to rely and have faith on him, being led by his Holy Spirit. My first point really is that as the Holy Spirit leads us, we'll be led towards vision. We'll be led into a vision. Vision is one of my favorite things. And it's not because I had it growing up. I came from a very unassuming family, like I mentioned. My dad grew up in Glasgow, and his dad worked on the docks. And uh, they, they, they lived, as he was growing up as a child, he had to kind of give all his money, whether it was a paper round money, into the family pot just to kind of keep things going. But they grew up in a one-bed flat, and my, he, my dad had two brothers, so they had the bedroom. I think mom and dad were in the kitchen, and he had a little alcove in the, the kind of the living space, which he said was the best spot because he actually had some privacy, and, uh, you know, <laughs> he could have some of his own things kept in that little space. But as I fast forward, you know, life has transformed. I was just reminiscing with my dad a few uh, months ago now and just sharing about how life has transformed from where he started out as a child. You know, today... We've got a, um, one of our other businesses, some holiday let properties, and we tallied up that between them all, there's like 22 bedrooms but, uh, you know, that we kind of manage, look after, including our own home. And I was like, this is mad. And God put a vision, put a vision on my dad's life to think, we don't need to stay where we've been. I want better for my children. You see, God has designed us, and there's that desire on the inside that says that we do want more. We want to see more of God's kingdom more of heaven here on earth. We might not use those words, but there is something that we cannot deny that desires better, better for our children at the very least. You see, I love vision. When Dave, when we kind of came into the church, I'd hear Dave speak and preach, and I thought, what planet is this guy on? Honestly, I mean, we, we sometimes say, in fact, we went to a conference one time, and there was a, someone speaking over Dave and Shelley's life, and they said, you're in a different stratosphere. <laughs> and they, I think they even called him a spaceman. <laughs> I was like, it's true, because he just thinks so differently. Or let me put it another way. He doesn't think like the world thinks. He talks about things which aren't there, but maybe could be. And he spoke to Anna and I about maybe starting a business. He nurtured it. He himself had done businesses, not all that had succeeded, some that had failed. And yet he said, why don't you? Why don't you consider creating something? that could help and serve other people. I just want to share a, a, a couple of pictures and uh, just, just, to sh uh, just to give you an idea of our journey of, of the, the children's nursery. And the first is, um, it's of one of the rooms that we developed. And oh, there you go, that's the start point. This was in an old secondary school, and this was a DT room, so full of rubbish. Um, we were using it as a church, so like anything, any storeroom does get used for everything and anything. Um, but we, we start to look at this room and think it could transform. And we start to clear out all the mess like you can see. We start to, you know, I think it was Anna's granddad help us build all these kind of wooden casings around the radiators. And then in time, we put the, the floor down. We had to reglaze all the windows because they'd all been smashed by, you know, youth that had been around the, the, the fields and stuff. And then eventually, we filled it with uh, some children's equipment. You notice it's dark outside because we always finished very late at night, <laughs> trying to make sure that the room was ready for the kids the next day. But God put a, a thought in our mind. He put an idea that as we started to pursue it, things started to fall into place. You know, Zechariah 4 verse 10 says, Do not despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. I want to encourage you, small beginnings. I love small beginnings. We don't despise it. We encourage it in, in church because we all start out small. If we always think it's got to be big, then we often don't even bother starting the journey, starting the adventure. But when we know that we can look at a small space and think maybe, perhaps, this is an idea, this is a vision. I want to say, you know, in, in Proverbs, no, Psalms, it says, God gives us the desires of our heart. I believe that God will use desire to help give you a vision of your future. 
Joel 2 verse 28 says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. You see, I believe God uses the language that we understand of dreams, vision, or another word, desire. You know, he gives us desires. And as we start to look at those desires, we move towards in that direction by faith often. And a vision and a dream is really, for me, just a better future. It might be a better future for your family. It might be a better future for your children. It might be a better future for your career or your finances, your health. But God can give you that vision, give you that hope that there is something brighter and bigger ahead of you. You see, that when, when vision comes in, it gives hope. One of the byproducts of vision is that we have hope. Without it, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, is without vision, the people perish. It's why it's so essential. We were designed when God created the earth. He didn't just say, voila, all done. Over to you. Just, <laughs> just sit back and relax, Adam and Eve. No, he said, go, subdue the land, take dominion, multiply, add to, create, create cities. He, was look, he gave the raw materials, but he said, use the imagination. I've given you a whole world to populate, to bring God's kingdom, heaven here on earth. It's a phenomenal vision. So I just want to show one video, which is really the, the video of our nursery and, and how it started. Um, it's not enough time to show you all the journey, but when we, when, we, when we started the nursery, it was in this old secondary school. And, uh, and a few years in, we had a fire. And we basically were given an ultimatum by the council to say, you have 12 weeks to get out. In fact, it was eight weeks. The reason it was eight, and I remember that, is because we knew we needed at least 12 weeks to get a porter cabin dropped somewhere on some piece of land and up and running in time. But what happened is in a few weeks after that meeting, God, there was a property that came onto the market. Anna spotted it late at night. I remember it being midnight, I'd fallen asleep. She said, Andy, wake up, look at this. I'm thinking, what is going on? And she, we'd been looking for properties. We had tried different plots of land and it had all kind of fallen through. She said, look at this. We viewed it the next day. And then the day after that, we made an offer. And we didn't have any guarantees or assurance that we could build a nursery because we had to get planning, we had to get building control to approve on things. But this was really the journey of, of how the nursery began. An old barn with some stable surrounding, that's the inside. But again, this is the journey of transformation with the video.
start, it starts with a vision. And I could tell you countless stories of how when we bought the building, we spent all the money that we'd saved up to build a nursery or to rent a building on buying just the property. We had no money left and we somehow had to convert it to a nursery. And the count, I remember going into the bank and getting laughed out pretty much the first time and the first year we went in and different situations. Because when you have a vision and when you start to step out in faith towards that vision and pursue it, I can guarantee one thing, the spirit will lead you through challenges. See, Jesus said to his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. You see, you will face challenges, obstacles, opposition when we start to pursue a vision. And we start to pursue as we're led by the spirit towards a vision from God. You see, because he's, he's, he's looking at us and saying, I need to test. I need to prove, you know, what's going on on the inside. See, God looks at us and says, I want to do more in you than what you think. It's about the destination. He wants to work through us, work through the fears, the, the reliance on, on man or the reliance on your own personal strength and intelligence and instead say, no, you're going to need a whole new power source called the Holy Spirit. The challenges we face. I was, it always messed with my mind thinking, why are these challenges happening? Like surely, like God, you've turned up so many times. It was miracle after miracle. And then you get a challenge and thinking, come on, just strain it out. Like get the iron out and just make life a little bit easier. And yet God knows that we were made for battle. God knows that we were designed. Victory doesn't come without a battle. You see, I love in Joshua, God speaking to his servant. And it's like he's just handed over, Moses handed over the baton to Moses. And God is saying very clearly, very bluntly, maybe in a way that a Glaswegian would say it, Moses, my my servant is dead. Nothing else to say. Not going to dwell any more on it. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. It's like, just cross in. But what we know is that there were battles to fight. It sounds great in the moment when God gives you the vision saying, oh, it's beautiful, the promised land, slavery, promised land. And yet, when we start to go towards the promised land, what do we find? Problems, challenges, opposition, enemies that are there that need defeating, conquering. He goes on to say, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon right the way through to the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea. I'll skip a bit, but it says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. You hear that phrase at least three times. Be careful to obey all the law my my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so you may be careful to do everything written in it. There's a reason to come to church. Why? Because then you will be prosperous and successful. See, when we come to church, we're reminded of God's word. We need the reminder in just in the same way God was having to remind, keep it on your mind that you may meditate on it day and night. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You see, God knew that discouragement was going to come. I still can't imagine what it would be like facing Jericho. And uh, I had a bit of a sleepless night a few weeks ago because I'd made a mistake in some calculations. And I just couldn't get it out of my head. I was thinking, oh, I've messed someone around and I'm going to have to call them up tomorrow and apologize. And for some reason, I thought about Jericho and thinking, I imagine what it'd be like the Israelites camped around and then the scouts saying, you wouldn't believe it. We thought the walls were thick, but you have no idea. Like they're really thick. We thought it might be at least like two, four foot. It's like 40 foot thick, these walls. I really hope Joshua knows what he's doing. And that thought of like risking your life for the battle, not knowing exactly what's going to happen, but trusting that the man of God, trusting that God is going to turn up and do a miracle, led through a challenge. We know the end of the story, but when it's going on in your life, you wish the Bible had the end of your story written down. The beautiful thing is it does because Jesus wins. Jesus won everything. We know how everything ends and it's Jesus is victorious. 
When he comes again, it's to rule and to reign. Sin being eradicated. Heaven being brought to earth in its completeness. You see, John 1, 4, verse 4 says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. As we face challenges, God is looking to forge something on the inside that's stronger than the challenge on the outside. He's looking to say, no, you were built for this. You were born for this. I gave you that vision. And as you start to pursue it, my Holy Spirit will lead you, but you will face challenge. And I believe when we were building that building, my conclusion of God at one point was, he is brutal, just brutal. (laughs) And it might be a strange word, but when I got phone call after phone call of things that were going wrong, I got the, the builder saying, you know, we missed out 20 grand's worth of wood. And I'm thinking my heart sunk. And I was in a meet with a few of our small team. And they just were like, What's, what was that about? I said, wow, we've just spent, lost, however you want to put it, 20,000 pounds. And we were a tiny, tiny business <laughs> just there to survive. And we were knocked over the show. Different things that we, you know, professionals that were trying to say, oh, no, you can't do this. And then I promise in a few months later, we were doing exactly what they said couldn't be done. God wants to forge us through the trials. And here's the thing. Sometimes when we're facing those challenges, they don't always go the way we want. Because the Spirit will also lead us through failure. And I hate to say it because when we believe in God, we've picked up the tool. We've got the sword of the Spirit. We've got God's Word. We've got the Holy Spirit on the inside. We think we're invincible, and we are. But there are times when we're led through failure. Despite God being on our side, he wants us to take us through that journey of experiencing sometimes what can seem like devastation, to teach us, to train us, not to just rely on our emotions, but to rely on his promises and his principles in the word. When, when I mentioned earlier about the, the nursery having a fire, it hit us like a ton of bricks. Three in the morning, getting a call Thursday night, and it was, it was the alarm company saying, your alarm's are going off. You need to get there just to see what's going on. As I'm driving, we lived just not far away, 10 minutes. I could see smoke and flames going off. When I got on site, there were five or six fire engines dousing the whole building in water. It got to about six in the morning, and I was just stood there trying to process everything and thinking, right, I can start calling around our staff, which at the time we had maybe 15, maybe 20 tops. I said, I could get them to come here and we can start tidying up, you know, mopping the floors, you know, getting the debris out of the way. Parents are going to turn up at eight. I was like, we've got a bit of time. We can sort it out. And I remember the fire chief, as I, I suggested this idea, is like, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a crime scene for one. And number two, the whole building is, is, is absolutely ravaged by the fire. You know, your, your gas, your electricity, your water, it's all off. We've had to turn it all off. And I was just thinking, what is going on? And that one of the miracles is that while, while, we, while that happened on Thursday uh, morning, we were so, so close, we were Thursday morning, Friday, we were shut. The next week happened to be the half term. And the school that we had inhabited, they had got a brand new school just down the road. And so we were able to be in one of their classrooms during the half term break while they were not using them. So we were only closed for two days during that fire. The next week we were there clearing it out, redecorating, reflooring just renovating the whole place from top to bottom, trying to get it ready. But I remember shortly after the fire thinking, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the end. Do you know what? And I came to that point thinking, but even if it is, I'm grateful that my kids are completely safe and the children, nursery children, they weren't. It was in the middle of the night the fire happened. But I remember thinking, do you know what? We can sell the car that we had just bought. We've been ba- living off bikes up until then, getting shopping and different things. We can, we can sell the house that we'd recently just moved into. We'd gone from a two-bed apartment to a three-bed semi. We'd just got our second child, Micah. And so we just thought, right, we can, we can go back. But there was one thing that I did know. I would go again. Because I knew the miracles that God had done in my life, even despite this devastating fire, was still true. And so I know that we don't plan to fail, but at some point, I don't want us to be completely shaken when failure does knock on our door. I only have to, we only have to look at the Bible and the, the, the patriarchs of the faith, people like Abraham, lying about his sister being his wife, sorry, his wife being his sister. You know, Moses getting angry and killing someone, murdering. I, I wonder how he felt when he then got the Ten Commandments later on thinking, oops, <laughs> really messed up that, <laughs> just in time. And then you've got David, you know, killing one of his closest men in the army, committing adultery. Solomon, there's every character that you look at experienced failure at some point. 
And yet, God looks, his grace is sufficient, that when we fail, that is not the full stop, that is not the end, because he wants to take things from the ashes and resurrect. That's the business of the God that we believe. He resurrects, he does the impossible. And when we fail, when it's handled right, it leads us to the next part of the journey, which is humility. The Spirit will lead us to a place of humility. The number of times where things have just gone wrong, and yet you, you hate it because you want it to go right. You're planning it to go right. I remember budgeting for the building, thinking it's about 480,000. And I'd gone to advisors, people that knew about buildings. I knew nothing. I could barely change a light bulb, let alone try and build a wall. And so starting the project, I was overwhelmed. But people had said, oh, yeah, you're only really changing the roof. And uh, there's a few minor alterations. I said, I think this is a realistic budget. And then realizing that the build, we literally had to go back to the bank and say, we've run out. And if you don't give us, it'll all, it's all gone. And they, they, they lent us more money, but it cost us about 1.2 million in the end. A lot of mistakes in that, that money as well that we'd spent. But I was, I was tormented by certain scriptures saying, you know, a wise man counts the cost before he, uh, he builds the house. I'm thinking, oh, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried, I tried. But we're led to a place of humility. James Chapter 4, verse 6 and 10 says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will elevate you. Pride stops so much of God's goodness coming towards us. And yet, if we can receive that humility, God's Holy Spirit doing a work on the inside, doing a work on our character where we can say, do you know what? I have failed. I have messed up. And it's okay. It's not the end. Whether that's in business, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in how we're raising our kids, whether it's at work with our boss or our colleagues or people that we're leading, you know, when we can have that humility on the inside that says, you know what, it's going to be okay. I'm, I'm going to ask for forgiveness. But the Bible talks about how a righteous man falls down seven times, but he gets back up again. And that's the power of humility that we don't have to be stopped when things go wrong. See, we're different to the world that thinks, well, that's it, just gonna throw it in. I, I, you, I mean, look what's happened. It's a fire, it's probably God who's caused it. You know, and might as well just throw in the towel now, or your marriage, well, yeah, you know, the affair happened, or I, I, saw, I saw some text message or some emails, it's over. And we just cut things, sometimes prematurely, when God is saying, no, let it produce humility on the inside. Because when humility is on the inside, ultimately, the Spirit leads us into our destiny. My final point, our destiny is bright and beautiful. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That scripture that was at the end of the video, Ephesians 3, 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, like you can't measure it, like the, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable than what we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. I want to, I want to say the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into our destiny, lead us into that place that is beyond our comprehension, beyond our wildest dreams or imagination. Because as we start to venture into that vision, we start to take that step of faith out of the boat, standing on water thinking, I'm not qualified, we weren't qualified. I haven't got any uh, degrees or education that could support me starting a business. I haven't got a background or a family upbringing. We didn't have the money required. And yet, when we step out in faith, the challenges come. We go through those challenges with God at our side. We experience times of failure where we think, we question the doubt. I just want to pause for a moment and say, that's where the church is so powerful. Because when you are going through those valleys, and you've got brothers and sisters around you who can encourage you and say something, say, keep going. I have people saying, keep going, Andy. Don't give up. Without the church, I would have given up because I know me. But with the church, hearing God's word, coming into worship, raising our hands when we really didn't feel like it, but thinking I'm going to declare, I'm going to praise because I know our God is greater. I'm believing those lyrics. I've seen other people in the congregation where they've had a breakthrough. And I'm going to cling on to that thought, onto that scripture. Because as we go through certain failures and humilities produced, we are led closer and closer to our destiny.
It's the reason I called the message The Greatest Odyssey, not because of my adventure or anything, but because the greatest adventure that you can embark on is one where the Holy Spirit is leading you from within, where your life, the desires that God has placed on your heart, woven into your DNA, start to manifest, start to come about. You know, what you thought was just a dream, a pipe dream, actually starts to materialize here on earth. And as you walk towards that vision of a future, God moves in powerful ways, miraculous provision, relationships that open up possibilities. I absolutely love it. So let the Holy Spirit inspire dreams and visions like, like Joel said. Let the, let the Spirit lead you through those challenges, those failures, humilities into your destiny. If you just want to bow our heads for a moment and close our eyes, I just want to pray, pray for us all. Every week, you know, there's an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and to receive the Holy Spirit that I've been talking about, the Spirit that can take you from where you are into a bright and glorious future. If that's you today, and you want to receive the Holy Spirit, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your King of Kings, I just want you to say this prayer in your heart after me. Jesus, I want to repent. I want to turn away from the way that I've been living my life. And I instead want to make you the King of my life. I want to receive your forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. And I want to invite the Holy Spirit into my life right now. Lord, I, I pray that you will transform me from the inside out. I thank you for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. For the rest of us, I want to pray over us that the Holy Spirit will today give you a fresh and new revelation of the destiny and the plan and purpose he has in mind for you. That, that you'll choose to actively partner with the Holy Spirit, that we will receive God's power on the inside, that we won't fight it, negate it, that we'll make the Holy Spirit and God Almighty and the Word of God the authority in our life. God, I want to thank you for your grace and goodness. Please open up our eyes to see who you are and what you want to do within us and accomplish through us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to partner with you, the greatest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.